Welcome everyone. I'm Caro O'Shea, the coordinator of The Voice and host for our webinar. Tonight we have planning and delivering projects, the Rotary of Elizabeth Keyway, presented by Tristan Cole. And Tristan does want to have a conversation with you all about that. So hope we've got plenty of questions for him. Tristan's been a leader in the Rotary family since 2009. He's really passionate about hands-on and visible <laughs> leadership. He's led and empowered teams to create positive change since 2008 with Army experience and a degree qualification in HR from Curtin. Tristan's been very active in the Rotary family, helped to start a Rotary club, reinvigorate a couple of other clubs, and has led the delivery of over 20 fundraising and community service events during that time. Over to you, please, Tristan. Cool, thanks, Kero. And look, thanks all for joining us today. And um, I guess to, what so we'll cover today, uh, as by way of content. Um, I'll have a few questions for you guys, just so I can get a bit of an idea in terms of uh, how I can best focus uh, today's conversation. I'll have a few things to share from, um, from a methodology standpoint in terms of event planning and executing. And then uh, very keen to hear some questions from your end to see how uh, we can value add from there. So I might invite you all to grab your mobile phone and we'll have a bit of a mentee conversation just to get a bit of understanding of some of those things. So I'll uh, kick off now. All right, so two questions. First of two is uh, what particular project planning topics are you keen to learn today? So for example, if you wanna focus on risk management, focus on marketing or what have you. So I'll be pretty keen to understand that. So yeah, certainly feel free to share with me what project planning topics you're keen to learn today. Okay, so team building, idea generation, cool, thanks for that. Okay, anyone else got any thoughts to share? Otherwise, we can pop on to the next one. Yep, plan the year ahead, okay, thanks for that. Cool, okay, so we've got a couple of there. So yep, team building, idea generation, and plan the year ahead, so some pretty substantial ones. Okay, so the next question I've got for you all is, what current or upcoming projects or events are on your mind? And this will be good for me to know to understand, uh, yeah, again, any particular project types to follow to, uh, to talk about in a bit more detail in today's conversation. Oh, by the way, and so just to um, uh, uh, familiarise uh, familiarize yourself with the tool. So if you actually um, uh, use your mobile phone and pop into uh, menti.com, so www.menti.com, and use the code word 281263, and that's all on the top of the screen here. Uh, that'll help you um, actually contribute your, your responses. Okay, so we've got a conference event. Cool, thanks for that. Cocktail event, sounds like fun. Awesome, okay. So thanks for that. That gives me a bit of an idea in terms of what to focus on. So we might now just pop into uh, the actual uh, key content for today. Right, team, so what we'll cover today is a planning and delivering projects. Now, just to recap on what we covered in a previous session, and some of you may have been here, but some of you may not, which is perfectly fine. Um, but this actually covers some of the topics that we discussed in terms of uh, building um, a team and gathering interest. And, there was a, and I'll talk about a short four-step process as part of our recap, so I won't go into great detail. Okay, so this topic was earlier about uh, building a team and gathering interest. And um, just to, as a quick recap, first step is to listen and understand your people's interests. And this can be done via one-on-one -on -one conversations with you as president or a board member, one-on-one -on -one conversations with your members or in small groups to really understand, number one, what they're interested in, number two, what their skills are, so you can best suit what project or event to organize. Um, a good example that was done by our club previously was running an actual virtual session like this, where we use tools like Menti, which we used before, to help gather interest in what particular proposed projects that were of interest. And in a more recent gathering, we discovered that, okay, people are keen to do a uh, food bank, they're keen to do a come cook with me virtual cooking event, as you can see in this first image here. Um, that gives you an idea of the volume of interest for members and to help target what kind of activities to do. Um, the second activity was a bit of a brainstorming event that helped actually understand again 
on a more intimate level what interests the members have and that helps shape what kind of activities can be channeled from the year. So the big conversation there is assess and listen to what your people are interested in. Okay, the second step was showing people how it can be done. So really to, uh, to provide um, encouragement to your members, you as a leader of the club can actually show how a event can be successful. Um, and these are some examples. More recently, we had a Vinnie's, a Vinnie's house painting session where we painted the houses of refugee centers for victims of domestic violence. And uh, another example I've talked about today is we had a food hall for Vinnie's, which was a single day uh, gathering of donated non-perishable food to go into uh, St. Vincent de Paul's COVID relief initiative. Okay, so second step, show people how it can be done by leading by example. Third is to empower and encourage your people. So after you as a project lead, successfully executed a project that should encourage others to do the same. But also you as a project leader or as a leader within your club to encourage other members to actually um, support them in helping deliver their own projects. So empowering and encouraging your people. And last but not least, to importantly, recognize your people and celebrate success. And that's very important to make sure that there is recognition for all the hard work your people do, um, particularly for those who may not be entirely visible in that project delivery to show you, to show them that their efforts were very much important and worthwhile. And this is encouraging and important to encourage others to contribute to the club, but also by word of mouth, encourage others to actually uh, gather to your club and do good works. So that's a bit of a recap um, in terms of how to attract members and people, recruit members and people into your club and into your projects. Underpinning all of that is a bit of a motto that I believe in, which is leaders create leaders. So what we're doing today is sharing this knowledge so you guys can go about and create the same levels of success or create success amongst yourselves in your own clubs. All right, so today, guys, what we'll cover today are two key things. One, understand the critical elements of a project or an event life cycle. And number two, to be able to apply these elements to a current event or a future event, planning your membership conferences, planning your cocktail events. Okay, so the top project planning tips. Now, there's more tips that I'll have to share. And keeping in mind that, what that whatever works for me um, doesn't necessarily is a one size fits all, but it has worked for me. And I think I feel that there are some methodologies that can be shared and transferable into the Rotary universe. So, firstly, have a clear vision. Second, manage your project risks. And thirdly, have a project management toolkit. So, today, we'll give you some tools, both virtual and basic, that I'll share with you uh, to help reduce risk and enable success for your project. All right, so we're going to talk about here now the critical event elements. Oh, by the way, if I go too fast or too slow, if you have any uh, burning questions, certainly feel free to, uh, to stop me and I'll be happy to uh, slow down and um, yeah, clarify as required. Okay, first thing and foremostly, feasibility, understanding and making sure that the project you're talking about actually has a strong chance of success, right? The SMART principle specific, measurable, achievable, relevant time base that comes into play. And again, I'll actually deep dive into this point. So I'm just going to go through them in a shopping list at this stage. Planning, this is quite a deep one. So we're talking about project management, logistics, sponsorship, and marketing. These are the core elements of basic project planning. Without these elements in play, you have a strong likelihood of failure. Execution and managing risk. Now, this is quite critical. Again, reducing risk to your club, reducing risk to the project as well. So these are the key elements of success that we will deep dive and talk about today. And of course, last but not least, bigger part and the fast, the last element. And this is also not as critical, but still quite important is follow up uh, to make sure you review, review success and to ensure that you recognize your volunteers and, and also to follow up on your sponsors, event partners, vendors, and so forth. Okay, so we're gonna talk about feasibility. 
Now, within feasibility, um, there is an objective test that over my experience over the last 10 years plus is quite, quite important. Number one to four is very critical with you as a project leader. If you can't answer affirmatively to these four, then you are, then you have a strong chance of failure. And that's not a bad thing because it means that you need to review, okay, what's going to be another activity that I can review that will yield a higher chance of success? First and foremostly, do I have an achievable mission? Okay, what is achievable? That's something that yourself and your club will be able to determine. Will I make this project a priority? So as a project leader, if you look at your pyramid of priorities at any point in time, family, work, friends, hobbies, this initiative ideally needs to be number one or number two on your list of priorities to enable success. Why? Because that comes number three. Will I make careful decisions quickly and confront stakeholder issues before problems occur? If you're willing to make this initiative project a priority, then you should not have difficulty in actually going back to your team and reverting to them if, you have, if they have any questions or queries, decisions to make or stakeholders to manage. Because without that quick decision making, you'll demoralize your team and increase your chance of failure. Now, fourthly, do I believe in what I am doing? Now, underpinning all of Rotary is what? Service above self. So that is the imperial mission above everything that underpins what we do. We're not doing it, we're doing it, yes, for the cause. We're not doing it for us. Yes, we're doing it for the club. But there is a greater mission before us that we are embarking upon. So if we're raising funds to a cocktail event, what are those funds going towards? They're going towards a charity in need to help fight domestic violence, to help break the cycle against poverty. The conference or the gathering that we're having, the social event that we're having, that is intended to what? To help build our membership base, to help sustain our club, so our club can continue enabling positive change in our community. Okay, target audience and attraction. Now, Kerry, uh, Kerry Packer, who's a commercial leader, yes, had two business sayings, one business saying comprising of two limbs that remarkably quite important in commerce, but also quite applicable very easily in the business of philanthropy. Who is my audience and what am I selling to them? Who is my audience? Who is my target audience that I'm selling my event to? And what, is my, what am I selling or what is my value proposition? Because whatever you're selling needs to be competitive in that market, in that field. So this is very, very important. So to understand, are you willing to prioritize your project? And are you clear on who is your audience and what exactly you're sharing with them? Now, moving further to feasibility, okay, sharing risk and partnerships. What organizations are we supporting and how can they help make this event successful. Event goals, how do you measure success and what fundraising targets do we have? Because if we're gonna actually sell an event, we need to be very clear about what are the key levers of success. So we know that our volunteers will make it, make it understand it's worthwhile for them, but also to understand, particularly for your sponsors, that they know, okay, I'm raising, I'm doing a charity Pilates initiative. I'm hoping to raise $500 at least because that will help me enable a one week stay for a family in need at the domestic violence refuge center in Gosnells, right? So having very clear goals that will help enable success. That is good for your team to know what they're aiming for in terms of targets, they can work harder, but also have your sponsors understand a clear, clear fundraising or clear sponsorship figure so they know where that money is going towards. Team structure, if you have a 2IC who will act in your role, that's ideal. I personally, for every, every initiative I've ever had, had someone in mind who was going to be my backup person in case I needed help or if I'm going to be indisposed of, who can make decisions on my part. But the good thing about 2IC is that they can also help if, when the project's successful, they can actually help drive success for that project among, on their own as an independent in future. And that's not a sneaky way of identifying future leadership potential in your club. Cost, benefit, feasibility analysis, right? So once upon a time, when I was in Rotary of Perth, we did a charity, we were planning and executing a charity, uh, charity winery tour. 
And we made the smart decision to actually stop that event because we were not actually getting sufficient ticket sales to make it successful. Because we knew we had a particular number of tickets that needed to be sold. And it was too, and we reached an actual point in the event that was like, okay, we haven't raised enough tickets. Therefore, if we continue this event, we're going to come across a loss because if we haven't passed a break-even point. So that's something we need to be mindful of. That's something that your team needs to know well in advance in order to help manage their risk risk of which we'll talk about a bit later on. Approvals, there's no point in having an event if it's illegal or if it cannot occur in the right time frame you want it to occur. We were not able to organize a, Road Reactive Perth were not able to organize their part, their Perth Homeless Support Group Ball at Palmyra Hilton this year, because why? It would have been illegal for them to do so because COVID restricted event gathering numbers. Okay, so these are documents here, are actual examples of some tools that can help you with uh, your actual um, event planning that I'll share a little bit later. Actually. Okay, project management. Ideally, now the items I have in blue are, are high priority amongst everything. The item in red is of critical priority. Now, again, coming back to planning your event, how do I know your event is gonna be different or successful? Because ideally it has a theme that will not only make it different from other events, but also help with the marketing and communications part of your event. When it comes to decorating your hall or decorating the venue, the theme helps back and play. If you're gonna dress up for the event to make it fun, you know what theme you have. If you're gonna create flyers or advertising material, again, you know what theme is going to underpin your color schemes and things like that to make effective marketing. Project tracking tool. This is the most critical, probably the most critical element of any project management that we'll, uh, we'll talk about today, but also um, in our experience of managing events. This helps us quickly and easily track the progress of not only your team members, but also help identify, okay, what is at risk? What has been done? What has not been done? And um, this can be as simple as a spreadsheet, or it can be as complex as a Trello tool, which I'll show, uh, show you in a little while. But a project tracking tool helps track what members are doing and not doing. Um, a quick example here is, this is an actual worksheet, and is, I'm talking about something that's ultra- Ultra simple and bear with me. Uh, beg your pardon. Okay, sorry, it's supposed to happen. Okay, so let's not worry about that. Okay, so this is an example of a tracking tool that was organized for a high T. And this basically talks about the financials, that's on a spreadsheet. And this actually talks about some of the other critical areas like the marquee area. But the, pro the important matter is that you have an actual project planning tool that actually lists all the key tasks and um, people in contact to engage with from a marketing perspective as well. Um, that's one example of a tool. Another tool I'll show you in a little bit is Trello. And that actually shows how you can easily digitize your project management in a single tool. Okay, project communication. So you've got tools such as uh, Slack. And um, Slack, which is what our club used to help digitize our communications, WhatsApp, Facebook chat, these are all tools that demonstrate how easy it is to hold meetings to communicate progress in a virtual setting during COVID break, um, during the COVID isolation period. So it's not only important to have communication tools to document who's doing what, but also ideally have a protocol in place. So we start a project, agree as a team, okay, how will I respond to communications? As in, will I respond within a day? Will I respond within 12, 12 hours? The set of protocols so expectations are clear in terms of when and how to communicate. Also, if someone doesn't even respond within a particular day, you as project lead know that you either have to make direct conversation, find out what's going on to resolve an issue, or better yet, you can actually um, override, not override, but act in their role if, if need be. Okay, um, documenting all your project materials is important. And I'll show you again Trello a bit later on, but that helps us once you deliver a successful event, you have the intellectual property to actually uh, leverage the contacts, the processes, the methods, the tactics uh, to do that event over and over again. 
And of course, holding meetings as required. So you're proactive on issues that may occur. Okay, here's some examples of successful events that occurred. So if you look at the actual photos, right, think about all the logistics and all the planning and preparation that went behind it. Didn't occur by themselves. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of uh, details we talk about, and this actually is a good segue into planning. Okay, logistics, venues, catering, event equipment. These are high cost and also very important high risk elements of a project. Now they need to be. Now these are also high cost items that you can also put onto your sponsorship documentation as well when you're asking for sponsorship. But ideally, Prudence says that you should get at least three quotes for every major capital item of an event so that you know the actual costs that are involved. But you can also help negotiate on getting a better quote for a venue or for catering. Because these two other quotes are equally as competitive, if you have a venue, particularly a vendor you particularly like, you can help use these multiple quotes as a negotiation tactic. Entertainment ideally needs to add value to the theme. So if you can have any event, a cocktail event, a dinner, the more items that increase the value proposition, like entertainment, um, themes, good quality catering, these are things that not only help improve your event value proposition, they also help improve the actual um, volume or content for your social media or marketing campaigns that may come as a result. Decoration, as we saw before, also adds, uh, adds value to an event from an atmosphere standpoint, uh, but also staffing is quite important as well. How can I get, where can I get volunteers from? Your club, other clubs, but also leveraging schools, volunteer programs, so that you can actually contribute to as a student's or high school student's volunteer hours. But there's another element about legality to talk about to make sure that you're actually legally able to leverage uh, volunteers from other organizations like schools. We talked about sponsorship, but again, um, when you actually choose, select an actual cause, it's also important to make sure you consider uh, what kind of what kind of sponsors you want to be affiliated with. Now, depending upon the values of your club, it may not may or may not be appropriate to go to a big four bank. Why? We discover the Royal Commission to Banking that banks like ANZ, uh, some of the big four like uh, Bank West had ethical issues with their customers. Does my club want to be involved or affiliated with an organization like that? That's a question you can only know from the values of your club. Some may say yes, acceptable. Some may say no, because of what we, what we stand for as a club. There are no right or wrong answers, but there is what is legal and illegal, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay, this is an example of a sponsorship letter. And it's that simple, but there are some key ingredients we need to be mindful of. Um, you may be, some of you may be familiar with this, some of you may not. But the key thing says, okay, we're seeking a sponsor for our charity fashion parade in 2012. We're raising money for Hope Uganda, which is a girls' school in Uganda. What we're seeking for is a uh, sponsorship. We're so we're gonna, you're gonna have exposure to 300 plus guests and we're seeking uh, makeup, beauty design, hair design and so forth. And what we're actually asking you to do is part with cash and the value proposition behind that is You also get benefits in the form of, and I won't go into this detail anymore, the benefits you'll get is branding recognition and also other elements such as mentioning our social media campaign. These are selling points that your sponsors need to understand and appreciate in order to help them agree to sponsor your event. Okay, other planning events, raffle items, selling auction items, these also all help add value by giving you additional rev revenue streams to your event. Now, by way of background, there are local banks, there are also local councils that actually have things such as budgets that can help part with cash to help you with your fundraising. Now, there are particular criteria to be involved, but, but the more local you are to that organization, that local bank or the local council or men's club, they will more likely support you because they're in the same geographic jurisdiction. Okay. 
So apart from planning, financials and legal, again, legalities, um, I'll talk about the uh, event we did where basically we did a food haul to accumulate a large volume of food in Leaderville. We need to get council approval for us to actually situate a truck in Leaderville to gather the food. So we had to make sure that we got the correct approvals in play. Otherwise, we as a club would have had uh, reputational damage done to us by situating a van, a truck in a location that we were not able to do so. It's important you have financial control of your event so that when we do reimbursements and reconciliation, it's all very transparent and clear. And you're also accountable as well. And when your club does their reconciliations and auditing at the end of the year or in the two years, depending upon your reporting period, everything is above board. Okay, promotion and marketing strategy. Now, this is quite important because you're talking of, you're advocating the event, uh, but you're also making sure that you're getting permission, you're getting permissions from your sponsors, from your cause to actually show that relevant content. Okay, um, media release and coverage. It's always good to let the local papers know what you're doing, but they're always looking for a feel good story. So it's always good to have relationships with the media for you to actually share that story itself. Digital marketing strategy. Now, this is very important. And I'll actually um, share with you a little bit uh, the value behind digital marketing. And also have a few questions for you as well um, about digital marketing, which is now more prevalent than ever. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm going to put a question to you all and invite your thoughts via chat. When you are sharing digital content on mediums, and we'll talk about Facebook as a start, what do we think, and feel free to chat about this, what do we think are the optimal hours during the day to actually share digital content? So I'll give you guys three minutes to actually, actually two minutes to actually share your thoughts and type up in the chat what do you think are good timings to share content on Facebook as a start. Okay, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., thanks for that. 5 p.m. to 8 p.m., yep, after work hours. 7 to 9, depends if it's someone's work or hobby, yep. 8 a.m. or 4 p.m., okay, getting pretty close. Good, good. Okay, now I'm gonna share with you a screenshot on our Rotary Club's, our Rotary Club social media insights panel. Okay, so this is what the data says. The data says, and I'll read this out because it's quite not very easy to read, a peak periods of our member traffic is around the hours between, okay, three, four, five, six, around 6 a.m., peaks around 6 a.m., as well as 5, 8 p.m., so around 6 a.m. to around after work, basically, to around, yeah, it's before 6 p.m., about 5, and then spikes again, later at night around 10 p.m now what is going to be different it's going to be different to every club and you can actually access these insights on your facebook back end page to actually understand these are these figures but it's important that when you have a schedule content for release you actually do it during these uh during these peak hours okay now second question is what do we think is more engaging content photos videos or text so I'll give you a bit of time to, to think about that what kind of content do we think is more engaging or attracts more engagement videos photos or text videos videos yep cool okay now, for our club, and again, this will be quite specific, different to others, but statistically, our club seems to gather a lot of engagement from photos and then videos and then text via link. 
Now, again, it's specific to every club, but photos are effective in quickly getting an impression in a feed and getting some attention. Videos are great for telling a story and can be as effective as well. But at the end of the day, it comes down to the insights of your club on what's gonna be more effective than not. Now, again, this is another insight from the uh, Road Rivers of Key Facebook um, insights page. This talks about the other competing clubs, not competing clubs, but other similar organizations. These are basically trends on what is engaging them. So we're actually right below Rotary of uh, Perth Rotary below them in terms of um, the similar clubs in our digital league that we are, I guess, yeah, it could be said ultimately competing with in terms of a similar demographic. So it's always good to know um, what is trending effectively amongst your competitors. So you as the club know um, how you're engaging content, but it also helps you understand when you're actually advocating your event, what kind of content resonates with your membership and also resonates with your overall following um, amongst, your, amongst your sectors, i.e. your other Rotary clubs. So coming back to marketing, it's important to know what kind of content is popular with your demographic. Um, but also if I were to take a step back, so we know what kind of content is popular. It's also important coming back to your marketing strategy to make sure that you actually have a plan that outlines what content you're going to release, when you're going to release it, and which organizations or groups you're actually going to be targeting i.e. your sponsors, sponsors Facebook groups, sponsor, sponsor demographic, your charity, and other affiliated groups that are relevant to your demographic. And actually having a plan on when and how to release content to those groups. And then from there, these insights will come into play. These are examples of some event posters. Again, every event we did had a theme, and from that theme helps actually, again, represent in your actual marketing strategy. Okay, now this is an example of a post that actually historically and statistically in our club has been the highest performing post that we've actually ever had in our digital media so far. Now, who wants to share insight? Actually, I'd invite you all to share again lastly via chat why we think, why you think this would have been the most popular post that has ever been, that's been released in this club's social media feed. So again, coming back to chat, feel free to share why you think this post is particularly engaging and has resulted in such a high engagement level. Yep, tap number of organizations, yep, tags, yep. Any other thoughts? Sorry, let me come back to that. Okay, correct. Yes, we've tagged a number of organizations. Now, if we were to deep dive, what is it about the actual images in this photo that are actually particularly engaging? Like what's, what's it, what is it about this photo that we think would actually create some interest? Yep, spot on me. These photos are actually pictures of people. In some cases, they zoom in, but they're just people also holding the holding actual items. So as you know, this was an, uh, a Facebook post of our actual St. Vincent de Paul food hall, where over a single day we gathered all this food. Now, the point is that we actually used food and people as subjects in our imagery. And according to demographics, or according to um, research done by Vogue by LinkedIn, the most popular imagery that actually is as engaging are images that feature people because it actually resonates with people. So the photos themselves of people can actually create an emotional connection with the viewer because the viewer feels that like they're actually looking directly at them and creates a bit of a greater connection. Or well, the different thing is that they're actually carrying particular products, they're carrying food and that food is intentionally gonna be shared with the underprivileged. So it actually enables an emotional response. And it could be said, these are one of some of the reasons why it gathered so much attention, but correct, it tagged, the post tagged people, it tagged organizations and featured emotionally provoking 
images, i.e. of people of different demographics as a group, as individuals, and you can see a child there as well, of course, going to provoke an emotional reaction. All right, so coming to execution. Now, importantly, this is quite critical. We're talking about execution, we're talking about risk. Okay, how do we know our team is on track? And we can know that through project tracking. So what I'll do now is I'll just share with you um, a project tracking uh, project tracking tool, Trello, that helps us manage risk, but also have a clear understanding of responsibilities and tasks. Okay, so we talked about some of our key issues. We talked about um, planning, marketing, logistics, follow-up. Now, this is Trello, and what Trello does, it's basically it's a digital tool that basically puts all your project management into a single platform by the use of cards to help work out the different, the different departments that are being managed, okay? So we've got here, for example, logistics. This is our logistics corner. And what do we have in the logistics? We have various tasks about logistics, okay? So again, we're talking about a single day food hall appeal. And if you picture your imagination, you have a massive truck. That truck was situated, we got permission from the local council of Vincent to situate that truck in a parking lot in town of Vincent. Uh, we chose that venue because logistically it was convenient. We got legal permission to do that. Leading up to the event, we had a comprehensive marketing program to gather attention, and the end result was we got 3.2 metric tons or 66 cars donating food on that day, as well as donations leading up to that day. To help them make that a success, so we had different departments where we actually managed risk. So logistics, the key tasks there were, um, for example, getting high vis vests, so we have the correct PPE. And Trello allowed us to work out that task. So that task was given to Kate Parker. The description there was a number of items. We had a checklist to make sure that that action item was ticked off correctly. It had a due date. The due date was the 13th of May, marked off as complete, all right? So we had a multiplicity of these different tasks that helped tick off the risk of logistics, okay? Another task we had here was uh, confirming what volunteers would collect what food. So we had a list of people there, and we also had the various tasks there and their due dates. We also had attachments that can be added, and these attachments consisted of things such as a checklist of items to tick off. Okay. So that's an example of some of the different tasks we add here. So what we have in green are tasks that were successfully ticked off by the due date. Communications and marketing. Again, we had a marketing and comms plan. So I see if I can quickly bring this up now. So the good thing about Trello is it actually allows you to hyperlink items back to an actual depository. So some of you may use Dropbox, some of you may use Google Drive, but these are areas where you can store information. Now, this is a marketing plan where we basically targeted different groups. Now, these are particularly Facebook groups of that cover Mount Lawley, Cavisham, Mundaring. Okay. And then we use a marketing plan to work out, okay, how many followers do they have? Because the higher the followers, the higher audience we can engage. Links back to the group and who is responsible for what. So you can see here, I was responsible for a few. And we had a few other people who were responsible for a few other different uh, groups to target. And this was an example of the social media uh, schedule that we had to release content on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, so forth. Um, this is an actual, for Instagram specifically, a day by day, hour by hour of what posts were going to be released. Again, you don't have to go into too much detail, it comes down to what your needs are and just some statistics around the actual um, engagement. Okay. So that talked about marketing, staffing on the day, you can, you can actually, we actually use this from a logistic perspective to share imagery on the actual routes in and out. So to use your imagination, we had a truck set up here, and this was planned to be the ingress and egress for the actual event for vehicles and traffic. Okay, so the point is that Trello is, a, is an example of a digital tool that helps, that has easily helped us Success by 
having accountable a project plan, people with clear responsibilities and dates and times to work out when and what was was uh, was due, and who's responsible for what. But also, if you see that some of these items turn red, you as a project manager can say, hey, this is risk. Why hasn't this been done? I can see risk areas. I, as project manager, need to intervene. Okay. Now, it's very important to make sure that you have either this project management, a tool like Trello, or a similar project management tool to help manage risk. Because if you don't, you are, you are liable to encounter all kinds of drama. And actually, um, there's an example I'd like to share now um, that also talks about risk management. So what we've got here under risk management was an actual safety brief. Now, this was particularly important for during the COVID period itself. Um, we actually had a safe, uh, risk management brief that actually allowed us to work out uh, what were the big risk areas involved regarding our event and how we were going to manage them. Okay, for example, we had a medium level risk and this will be important for whatever events you manage, whether it be a cocktail party or an actual event conference, is that some of these risks are still quite prevalent now. Risk was COVID risk transmission, medium level risk. We identified that as, project, as our project team. And the description was transmission of COVID-19. So how are we going to mitigate that? And bear with me because this is actually not, um, this, this actual document is in a vertical presentation. Mitigation is maintain the actual current health regulations by maintaining 1.5 meter spacing. Other risk was, okay, vehicle collision with other vehicles and attendees, low risk. How are we gonna mitigate that? We're gonna assign staff to manage traffic flow. We're gonna make sure our staff are wearing high vis and we're gonna direct staff that there is a particular speed limit to abide by. How are we gonna manage that? By having staff out there managing traffic flow so this is a risk management plan, and that was very, very critical. So our club, the board actually had to approve this risk management plan to enable the event to occur. So this comes back to the importance of risk management and governance. If you were to have a people conference event, again, COVID-19 regulations would still need to be prevalent. You've also got other risks such as, okay, what are the likely injuries that could occur? manual handling, people getting drunk and bumping into each other. How are you going to mitigate that? First aid is, you're going to have security on site. So risk management, long story short, very important. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned here, but uh, for those who are dealing with children, um, risk management is also important when you're actually dealing with kids, uh, making sure your volunteers are working with children checks and to also have things such as uh, policies, codes of conduct in play to make sure that in the unlikely event a bad thing were to happen, um, you can actually make sure that you have policies in play that you can say, hey, all our volunteers agree to a code of conduct. This person clearly breached that code of conduct that he or she signed at the beginning. Um, how do you convince your club members to use these tools? That's a really good question. We actually had to, the way we found, or I found success is actually showing members online and actually worked out quite well during COVID is when we were isolated, we actually had virtual meetings. So we use Google Hangout to gather together, similar to Zoom, and actually do the same thing we're doing here, share on screen. And as I was actually going through the actual different project elements, such as logistics, planning, marketing, we would actually list down the various tasks and activities and actually assign people to them. So then I could actually see how it was working and then show them how to actually follow up. And then actually use the tool on a regular basis to show members that this is how we're actually tracking progress. So they actually have to learn by doing and being involved in compliance because we weren't using any other tool to actually show how the tool was working. And after that, once members actually got the hang of it, sort of value behind it, we're updating it regularly then it actually became quite easy for other members, for members to say, oh yeah, it's a great tool, you should use it. So those who actually used um, this tool during prior events actually used them for other events as well. It was a bit of a testimony as to how effective it was. There were some members, we have some members who find it difficult to utilize. So one of my members, Boris, found it quite challenging. So I actually worked with him one-on-one -on -one to help him work out how to use it. And after the hang of it, he's now using it widespread across other projects. Okay. So project management tools like Trello can help us reduce risk and um, shutdown date. This is something we brought up before about financials. 
um, it's also important to know this date so you know when to stop events. Um, situations where there was no project plan that actually enabled failure or difficult times. So, arguably speaking, so <laughs> this event here, um, Catwalk for a Cause, this is something that I'd run as a project lead for about four times. Our club had a go at, at actually utilising it, actually applying it as an event. An example where you really need to have a project tracking tool, this event, um, for a number of reasons, was not successful. But from observation as a member of that team, one of the key reasons why it wasn't successful is that there was no single point of project tracking of project management. And that had a negative impact on the event because there was no clear visibility in relation to where our different risk areas were being managed. So we didn't know, it was not clear to everybody or the project manager, are we on track with logistics? Are we on track with sponsorship? Are we on track with effective marketing? Because there were different silos operating independently and there was no single point of tracking. So if you're not going to have a project tool, at least have a spreadsheet to be able to visibly track where all the progress is at so you know where the risk areas are. And that is, pro that is why Trello is effective because quite clearly you can see, okay, these areas are green, they're on track. These areas need attention. We need to find out why they're not green. So lessons learned, definitely have project tracking to reduce risk to your event. Financials, make sure you pay your vendors on time, make sure you reimburse your members because there are a lot of generous people in our clubs and I've seen many members walk away having not been reimbursed and that's always a good thing. Safety, security, flexibility comes back to risk management. Follow up, very important. Make sure you recognize your team, your guests, your sponsors. And that's also a great opportunity for social markets, for social media, visibly recognizing all your stakeholders, your members, um, recognizing those who've contributed. And also it comes back to our members' own personal esteem and drive to make sure they keep correctly motivated. Debrief to learn your lessons learned. And also the benefit behind having project management tools such as these is that this now becomes a very valuable resource of knowledge, of contacts, of tactics you can use for future events. We're going to do this event again later on this year, our food hall. So all information here becomes very valuable. So all we have to do is reheat and serve, use similar tactics. So instead of reinventing the wheel again and again, consolidating your vendors, all the people who've attended your previous events and actually consolidate them all so you can make your future events successful again. And also leverage a great, a greater market, a wider, higher volume market than you would have previously um, enabled. Okay. Sustainability of the project. That's a, that's a good question. What do you mean? Sorry, um, what do you mean by sustainability? Okay, so we can come back to that a little bit. Okay, so that's basically the key, the key items of project management and management of risk. Cr critical elements, feasibility, making sure that you're confident with being able to execute the event, planning, execution, making sure you manage your risk, follow up for your members, follow up with your stakeholders, and always recognize your team. Um, because it's important to make sure that your team members feel involved and engaged and as well as recognized for the activities that may not be invisible to all. So today we've learned critical elements of the event project cycle and able to apply, and hopefully being able to be able to apply these activities, these elements to your next upcoming event. And project planning, have a clear vision, manage your risks, have good project management tools. And Yep, Melissa's a good point. So yeah, catwalk was used Trello's, used Trello, but yes, it wasn't adopted well with, without the team. Okay, that's a fair point. So thanks for bringing it up. Now, this this particular photo is quite important to me. And um, everyone's photo, so these are important rec team recognition. So people like Dragon and Zeshlin, I've been involved in in managing about 10 projects amongst the two of them. And the thing I'd like to share is that over time, recognition is important because it gives people motivation to actually stick with you in a project 
team. Dragon eventually, out of eight years involved in Rotary Act, ended up becoming one of the founding, mem founding members of Rotary of Elizabeth Key. So that's where good relationships and recognition comes quite important. Okay, and last not least, do I believe in what I'm doing? When things get very, very difficult, and when you as a project lead find you're losing motivation, or you're fed up or tired or feeling fatigued from what you're doing, remembering the ultimate cause of why you're doing your project, the ultimate purpose, that becomes quite critical to keeping you motivated to help propel you to enable success for your project. So that becomes very important from a motivation perspective. Okay, now that's basically the key things I wanted to share today. I now open up for questions. We do have some questions for you, Tristan. One that Arun posted in the chat a little time ago, I think it would be quite a useful one, a global grant project where they're apparently building public toilets for women in India. Would you have any, any particular suggestions to make regarding project management of a task like that, of a, of a project like that? Okay, public toilets in India. That's a really good question. Okay, so, the, so the, uh, the question is, how will we enable success for a project like that? Okay, so if you're managing that, okay, sorry. So Arun, is that project being managed locally in Australia or is it managed in India or both? No, Arun's in India, so I'm understanding. A global grant has a partner, an international partner and a local partner, and I'm gathering that Arun would be part of the local partner. Uh, okay, good question. Okay, so in no particular order to enable success for that project, right? So I probably, okay, so from a coming back to, to a feasibility perspective, okay, I'd say something should be doable, right? The capital value of the project block, of a toilet block um, shouldn't be a great, shouldn't be a major, a major dollar figure. So I'd say, yes, it would be feasible. Okay, so this is probably a good point about um, yeah, the uh, adoption of project management tools and making sure everyone's abiding by them. So make sure you have a good team of people who are willing to actually get the project off the ground. That's first and foremost, making sure that all those team members actually uh, subscribe to the tool. Now, uh, to execute, um, ideally amongst your team group, you would have contacts or people willing to engage with important stakeholders to enable that project success. Firstly, would be the local government or state government, those who would actually have a legal jurisdiction over that actual toilet block project. So they can advise for the correct standards from a sanitary perspective, from a building and construction perspective, and making sure that when the project is built, when the block is built, you know, abides by those building building codes. Next stakeholder group you want to get on board are sponsors or sponsors and vendors who would want to get that project up and going, i.e., local building contractors who will be willing to actually uh, deliver that project, ideally pro bono or ideally at a low cost. What would be in it for them? They would have um, visible publicity of their brand being recognised with a philanthropic project uh, to provide sanitary enablement for people who will be using that toilet block. So you're getting good vendors in place. So your project team will ideally have those contacts and relationships or be, be at least willing to engage a vendor or contract to do that. And thirdly, sponsors will be very, very important. Now, everyone in this group of stakeholders, right, council or government, vendor, contractor and sponsors, ideally would be local because they would want to be locally affiliated with that particular cause. So local businesses, ideally local banks or institutions who want to part with money, who want to be affiliated and known for this philanthropic success, would want to be a partner group in the actual, in the actual project delivery. And of course, you need to make sure you track progress throughout in relation to getting sufficient sponsorship to enable that project to be a success. So you can either pay the vendor, the contractor, and also within that project team, also making sure you've got government approval. So before everything, making sure you have legal approval to go ahead from a government perspective, making sure you then have the correct vendors in play to be willing to do the job, and equally as important, getting sponsors who'd be willing to actually enable that project success. If you're going to have a fundraising initiative because you can't get enough sponsorship, make sure whatever fundraising event you're going to do is going to be feasible enough to enable whatever dollar value would be in place to fund that project. 
So if we answer your question, so key stakeholder groups, again, local government, sponsors, a vendor or a contractor who could successfully build that event, build that uh, talk block. Thank you, Tristan. Thank you, Tristan. I do have another couple of questions for you. The next one relates to your success as a, as a participant in the resuscitation and renewal of Rotary and Rotary Act clubs. What part does good project planning or did good project planning play in, the, in those turnaround stories? Yeah, that's a very good question. Okay. Project planning in re resuscitating clubs. Okay. Um, I'm going to go two examples. I'm going to start with Rotary Act of, Rotary Act of Perth. Um, it started with six, basically when I got to, when I became president at the time, six members over 18 months, we changed that to about 24 financial members within an 18 month period. The biggest build up we had to do was actually execute projects right off the bat with the people, with the small number of people we had and their friends. So project planning was important because it got everyone actually actively involved. So coming back to some of the earlier principles about um, making sure that um, you have people on board was using strong project management to get members involved. Don't look at the screen, but I'm just going to go back to the actual earlier slide. Using project management to get your people actively involved in a task. So that everyone felt they're actively involved in delivering success. And then you as a project leader, leading by example to make sure that you're actually the driving point of that success. So they're forming up on you because that actually helps do a number of things. Number one, it actually helps people in your club to actually be involved in something together as a team that is yielding success, but also you as a leader to show that, hey, you're willing to get your hands dirty and drive success. So one of the first events that we did was actual uh, cocktail, actually a cocktail, it was a, sorry, it was an actual cocktail evening um, near the Perth Convention Centre. That was one of the first things we did. And following up that, we did a John Curtin weekend. These were all hands-on projects. And at that time, it helped me actually inspire others to get around the club to actually drive success. After that, they started doing projects on their own. But the key thing was they saw that it was possible to lead a project up. But the ultimate thing about Rotary is that we're all about initiating positive change, doing community service. So project management was important because we had to be seen as a club. We had to be seen as members doing positive things. And that was basically our core business purpose. After that, it became quite easy to actually help build a critical mass because after we successfully delivered projects, other members came on board as well because they wanted to get involved through word of mouth. So projects are important because it helps us visibly walk the talk. And then from that success, everyone wants to get involved and talk to good, and tells a good story through word of mouth authentically. Thank you, Tristan. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Um, this one might appear to be a, a sort of a, a bit of a Dorothy Dick sort of question, but I think it's important to just sort of discuss it for a moment. Previously, you, you when, in your last webinar, you talked about engaging volunteers successfully for, for projects. What's the relationship between a solid project planning toolkit and, and, uh, and process and continued engagement, successful engagement of volunteers? How do, how do those two run together? Yeah, yeah, okay, it's a really good question. So the question is about um, project management toolkit and involving members, okay. Now, I'll, get, I'll share my perspective. And the, the two are quite intertwined from a membership experience standpoint. Because underpinning Rotary, okay, one of the unspoken four-way tests, it has to be fun. So everything I've shared with you looks all very, very clinical and looks all very, very business-like, and, and it is. But when you, as a project lead, in the duration, in the execution of the project, right, you're gonna have, when you have small wins, that creates joy, that creates success makes everyone have small things to celebrate about and it creates good fuel for banter. And the feeling I get when I see some of the guys, like when Sean Williams ran the his more recent Vinny's food, correction, Vinny's clothes packing appeal, right? Little things, we're, yeah, we've got a deadlock in, great, you know? Everyone gets around that. Um, it becomes like a post that gets a lot of likes and loves and so forth. The two are intertwined because as we're delivering projects, it becomes like a little journey and that journey 
is punctuated with high points and low points. And when you have a challenge, that's fine, right? But I think it's when you overcome that challenge as a team, it creates a really strong, positive, emotional feeling that everyone's like, oh yeah, this is cool. We overcame that together as a team. That creates a positive membership experience. It also works, it could also work two ways, right? If you're are not a good project leader or not correctly motivated by the project, and if you are not, if you are not bought in, if you're not making this project a priority, and then your team who are involved with you, who are members and members of that project, don't see you responding quick enough, or don't see don't see or see that you're not responding, but you're posting stuff on Facebook about your cat or the great weekend you have with dinner with your mates. Then they're gonna say, hey, that person's not motivated. Why should I bother in this project? I'm gonna rack off and do something else. And that creates a bad membership experience. It demoralizes your team and can have a ne negative membership impact. So each project lead gotta make sure that your objectives, your feasibility, you're willing to make as a priority. Because if you're a good project lead, drive the push, celebrate success, you have a happy team. Um, but if you're not on board, you have a unhappy team and it makes your board's job a lot harder to retain members. Super. Thank you, Tristan. So one last question, I think, before we pack it up, after a brilliantly comprehensive presentation, Radio Elizabeth Key has a very solid strategic and club planning process, as was demonstrated last Saturday. What's the linkage between the specific project planning process and that broader club planning process? How do those two tie together? Yeah, it's a, okay, that's, um, it's actually not a hard question. I'm just trying to think about the best way to, to convey the answer. Okay, so uh, the question, so I'll respond to that question with a rhetorical question, and that is, what is the purpose of Rotary? And the purpose of Rotary is service above self. Our core business is to do positive things, is to do good. And underpinning that success are acts of good. Acts of good are organized through organized and executed through project management, right? Everything you can see on Facebook, all the fun events, all the bubbling sauce sizzles, all the fundraising dinners and stuff, that looks all great, but they're great stories and they underpin our purpose. But the project management of all this helps reduce risk to make those projects not only a success, but a big success. So what you don't see on Facebook all the projects that never occur, or the projects that were not managed well, or the projects people don't want to talk about because they would have had a varying level of success or the club may not be managed as effectively. So project management is critical to be able to tell a good story because if your project's managed well, you've also got comms as part of that journey uh, that illustrate the actual positive things that you've done. So yeah, to answer your question, the two are inextricably intertwined. You definitely need to have good project management to help effectively enable your core business, which is service. And service doesn't do itself, right? And um, Melissa brought up a good, really good point in the chat earlier, is that um, project management can render good stories, good experiences or bad experiences, right? But I, won't, I, say, I, probably, look, I won't say bad, okay? experiences that were not as successful that provide really, really good lessons to learn. So it's really important that, um, that when you actually embark upon a project leadership journey, it's really, really personally satisfying for yourself, for myself, because I've learned professionally from all the stuff that I've done as a leader. I used to be very bad at public speaking, right? But because of all this, it's helped me build success and build confidence. You gotta make it a priority in your life, right? Agree that with your partner, agree that with your family and friends. For the next four weeks, I'm going to be focused upon this initiative. And then the results will prove through themselves. You made it a priority and you made your team embark upon this journey. Great success, create an impact, they had a good time, you have a good time, you have something positive to talk about. And you help enable your club's purpose. Fantastic. So you get certainty, clarity, success, achievement. So the whole thing just rolls in beautifully together. Tristan, that has been marvellous, mate. I've kept well, an hour and 10 minutes in. That's 10 minutes longer than we normally go for, but it's... Mm. Just, I'm glad. I, I personally just got so much from that. What I'm going to invite everyone to do now, as our regulars would be aware, 
I'm going to invite you all to unmute yourselves, please, and join me in a round of applause for Tristan, because I think that's been an hour and 10 minutes really well spent. Thank you, Tristan. Thanks, Tim. And um, if I if I may briefly say that what I'm what I'm doing, I'm being the spokesperson for all the good work that all my project teams have done, right? So I want to just make it clear that if it weren't for the people that I've been actively involved in in REC, in Rotaract, these guys and girls have been the real drivers of success. So I can really recognize um, particularly some of the people in the call. Um, Melissa today, who actually um, did a lot of hard work in actually resurrecting the Trello group that I was able to show today. It took a, an hour and a half for her to do that. So I want to make a big thanks to Melissa for that, uh, but also being critical to a lot of the success we've had historically in the club and um, members like Min as well, who've been a real uh, enabler of success. So everything I've done, everything I talk about has been underpinned and enabled by team success. So thanks for all of you guys in the club, members who've been participating, and thanks for all of you for taking the time. And hopefully, yeah, you got some joy out of this and able to apply it to your respective clubs to yeah help this make, make this world a better place for Rotary. So thanks you guys. But isn't that why REC is such a success story? It's good team effort. Thanks, yes. and thanks, Kara, for organising the opportunity to share. No worries. Thank you. This has been a gem. On that note, also, I would remind everyone that we do have some some more great webinars coming up in coming weeks. Uh, the details are available in the mail app or a Facebook page or like. So, on that note. Thank you, Tristan. Tristan, if you could hang around, please, mate. And good night, everyone.